that, uh, let me quickly introduce today's opening keynote speaker, uh, Scott Fogel. Scott is a good friend. Um, I've known him for the past few months. Scott currently is a managing director at Accenture. Okay. Uh, but he ran a company called Advocate, which he'll talk about in a lot of detail for 20, 21 years. Is it? Yeah. 21 years. And um, grew it tremendously. And uh, eventually, it got so big that Accenture had to go and buy them out. Right. And um, not only is he been uh, active as a corporate leader in the Atlanta area for all these years, he's also a very generous individual, participates in, on several nonprofit boards, um, does a lot of good things, uh, helping entrepreneurs especially, very actively involved with what we are doing at Silicon Road. So uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Scott Fogel. Well, thank you, Sid. I appreciate that introduction. And I'm delighted to be here with you all tonight. This is a great audience, and I'm, as Sid said, I'm happy to be a part of perhaps giving back this evening. Okay. You want me to? Okay. Will do. Might need some technology assistance, even though I'm a, a technologist this evening. But I'm delighted to be here, because when Sid called and invited me to come speak, you know, when Sid calls, I, I listen. I really do. Secondly, you know, entrepreneurship is something that I'm very passionate about. Um, I've been fortunate enough to you know, kind of walk that story and live that life in the United States, and it's been awesome, and I'll tell you more about that here in a minute. Um, along the way, for us at Advocate, my partner and I, you know, dozens of people helped us. And they did it because they liked Tim and Scott. They didn't do it because there was a financial reason. And so I think it's incumbent upon entrepreneurs of all stripes to help other entrepreneurs, to help develop the next generation. Uh, we live in a phenomenal country where uh, innovators, risk takers, financiers come together. Can't do this in other parts of the world. We would not have been able to create the scale, the value, or the wealth, or the jobs that we created at Advocate and I think it's part of what makes our country exceptional. And I think that we need more entrepreneurs to continue to power our economy and provide opportunity. So those are, that's kind of my why here for this evening. So I was, uh, I was given the topic of growth hacks. And so I'll uh, want to cover four of those for you that were very important to us at Advocate. I was also asked to give you a little bit of context about who I am and a little bit of background so you'd understand maybe perhaps where I'm coming from. So let's see if the technology... Okay, we'll work. Okay, I've got a clicker. Perfect. So a little, some history and some context about me and where I've come from. So I'm an electrical engineer from Georgia Tech. So uh, that uh, was a great experience, probably one of the hardest things I've ever done. Also had, a pro after graduation, you know, 11 years with you know, some really big companies, NCR, AT&T by way of acquisition, eventually Scientific Atlanta, which was acquired by Cisco. I got my first entrepreneurial break uh, by working for a serial entrepreneur at a company here in Atlanta called RapidLink. Uh, it was a global telecommunications company that was looking for someone that had international business experience and we helped grow the company from $10 million to $50 million in sales and sold it. I was approached by a friend of mine uh, about creating a data center company, which was called Dantis, which I eventually agreed to do. That was one of those lessons where you learn from your mistakes. Uh, we had 12 people in the business plan, and we raised over $60 million in capital with an additional $100 million in debt. And unfortunately, that company was not successful. And it was not because we didn't have enough capital. It was because we were in a time back in 2000, some of you might remember those dot-com days where money was incredibly available. And you know, our investors and our board were expecting that you know, within the next few months, we're going to raise another $250 million, where this is at a time when the music stopped and there was no more money. And we had built a cost structure that we couldn't turn around. So it was a failure, unfortunately, but I learned a tremendous amount from the Dantis experience that I applied into eventually co-founding uh, with Tim Wise Advocate. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that. And that was a phenomenal experience. That was 21 years. We bootstrapped the business from two people up to 100 
We had to navigate September 11th, which occurred 45 days after we started the business. I thought the world was going to stop. We navigated the Great Recession of 2008. September of 2008, basically our bookings dropped by 60%. We weren't sure what was going to happen. Good news is we were profitable. We didn't have any debt. We had money in the bank. We had a reoccurring revenue engine in our business, and we survived to grow another day. And then, of course, most of you, you know, we're, we're all dealing with some after effects of the pandemic. Nobody saw that coming. That was another you know, challenge, and each of you as entrepreneurs, you're going to see those cycles. You're going to see that adversity. You're going to have to be prepared in your business and your, your leadership in order to be able to endure and sustain and be able to live to grow past those events. Some amazing stories. If you would, Sebastian, thank you. What was the inspiration, you know, I guess, for advocate or entrepreneurship? And I'll just share a few comments with you, then I'm going to get into the growth hacks. At Georgia Tech, well, it was very difficult. Um, you know, I'm a tech nerd by instinct, so I, you know, it, was a, it was a great school for me, and electrical engineering was a great degree program, but I learned that I did not want to be a true engineer. It was just too hard. <laughs> that was the lesson that I got from that school. And so what I wanted to do was go find a role for me I didn't, I didn't know how I could define it at the time, but I wanted the intersection of business and technology and not to go work in a laboratory, be a product developer, be an a true electrical engineer. The time at NCR, AT&T, Scientific Atlanta um, taught me that I didn't want to live in the big company world. It was dissatisfying. It was too slow. There were a lot of great things. I met a lot of great people, had a lot of great experiences. There was a lot of training. There was a lot of global travel. You know, a lot of building my network and establishing myself, but for me, it, it just didn't feel like home until I got the entrepreneurial break. And the you know, Rapid Link and Dantis were two phenomenal experiences that really helped kind of form me in terms of how I wanted to be an entrepreneur and the goals I wanted to achieve. At Rapid Link, I met my partner at Advocate. Um, we had shared values, common goals. We were complementary of each other. We both had a great work ethic, and we were both good sellers, which is really important in the entrepreneurial world. So that was, you know, the, you know, the inspiration for me and that company was to go and, and build something that we could be proud of that would be a great return for shareholders, that would be a great opportunity for our employees and provide phenomenal service to our customers. And that's Advocate. Just a little bit of a photo collage. Tim and I you know, started the business actually in, you know, the... A 2002 summit building within a year we moved to perimeter center place right here which is funny to be you know here tonight we created values we had a phenomenal team of people I, you know by no means will I tell you it was all Tim and Scott sure we got to set the direction take a lot of the risk yeah we also you know were there for a lot of the reward but there were a ton of great people that worked for us it was great people great customers revenue that eventually you know helped us you know grow the company to uh, you know to a capability that Accenture wanted to add uh, and I'm, for that, I'm very, very grateful uh, for this team. So capitalizing on my life's work, where did that all go? Um, we did in 2020 during the pandemic, we sought a, a private equity investor. We felt like Tim and I had taken the business as far as we could. We needed a partner that could bring capital uh, for you know, acquisitions, for strategy, for relationships. Spire Capital was phenomenal. They did a great job. We built this capability around technology finance. Effectively, if you think today, every company is a technology company. Every board and CEO wants to invest more in technology, but they want to do it smart. We created a methodology that CIOs and CFOs use to help optimize their technology run spend, which is the majority of their budget in most cases, and figure out smart ways to reinvest those savings in growth and transformation initiatives, i.e., getting more value for your technology investment. That's something that Accenture identified, said we want, yeah, contacted us, and we were fortunate enough to be able to put an agreement together. And uh, that was 2022. It was a wild ride from 2020, 2021, 22. There was a lot going on. I'm delighted to be at Accenture. It's a phenomenal company, if you're not familiar with. Amazing scale and capabilities, and I now have the opportunity to sell our services to the biggest technology buyers in the world and use Accenture's checkbook to help you know, acquire other businesses that could be additive to what our overall mission is. So. It's, it's a great experience. We're just finished deal year one. We checked all the boxes on our milestones and goals, and now you know, it's, we're off to the races. Okay. Thank you, Sebastian. They asked me to talk about life after exit. 
Uh, it's Accenture. It's TBD. <laughs> um, uh, well, I have some other entrepreneurial uh, visions at some point. My wife has also said, you need to work less and <laughs> you need to spend more time with me and with our, I have an 18 month old grandson and get some twins coming in September. So TBD, I'm having a lot of fun with Accenture and uh, you know, looking forward to the future. Okay, I think now this is what I was asked to kind of talk about. Hopefully, and my goal here is some of this may, you, may, you may already know, some of it may be new, but if one of you will take action, will take away a tip or a suggestion, and you'll do something with it, and you can create a customer, you can create revenue, you can create an initiative within your company and it'll help increase your probability of being successful as an entrepreneur, then that's success. That's what I'm looking for tonight. So I need you to all pay attention. You can take notes if you want to. Um, and feel free to ask me questions uh, afterwards or we can talk you know, after the discussion is done. But that, that's what I'm looking for is hopefully to, to create some spark. So I got four growth hacks, and these are things that we all did at Advocate that at the time, over the last you know, 10 years, they were different. They all created customer relationships, they all created revenue, they all created growth. One created our first acquisition. And so I'm gonna talk about each one of them in, in, in a little bit of a form, kind of a short form, because hopefully I'm still on time. I'm not, doing a, not managing my time, but hopefully I'm okay. Um, okay, Sebastian, if I could get you to be my Vanna again. Awesome. So the first one is performance fees, sometimes called sh you know, shared risk, sometimes called value-based fees. Effectively, when you approach your client with your offer, whether it's a product or a service, and the client you know, may not be convinced of the value or the outcome that they're gonna get from the work you're gonna do, the product you're gonna provide, one way to help reduce that risk or fear from the client is to say, you can pay me if I'm successful in creating the outcome that you're looking for. We use this as a services firm very effectively along with uh, fixed fee engagements, which was a traditional way of selling services, right? I'll give you this, you give me that. I'll give you a project, you give me $100,000. In this fashion with the performance fee, what we could tell our clients is a program with self-funding. Is if you didn't get the outcome, in many cases perhaps a cost savings outcome, you didn't pay us. And good news is after 21 years, we utilized this several hundred times, we always got paid. Because in the end, you know, we knew what the answer to the question was. We had a methodology, we called it a run reduction review. We could do some preliminary work with the client at no cost and identify whether they were a good candidate or not for a performance fee. So that's something you should consider too if you think about this. Also, I, I met a principal with a company, a software company today. They've created an application uh, and they've successfully deployed it at hospitals where they're going to help the hospital help manage the client after the, the patient after the patient's been discharged. Because in today's insurance reimbursement world, especially Medicare patients, you know, the insurance is only reimbursed if the outcome is achieved by the hospital. And so one of the ways they measure that is once you're discharged, you don't go back to the hospital within 30 days. These guys have developed a piece of software that looks to be really impressive. Um, and they don't charge the hospital if the client or the patient goes back to the hospital within 30 days. So it's a totally risk-based performance fee. Another example of how you can use performance fees in order to you know, create an advantage for yourself, reduce the risk or the fear for the client, fund the project. And in the end, at least at Advocate, the way we did this was, it was really important to us, if, if we finance the project for you, client, we usually got two to four times the fixed fee that we would propose. We usually got four to six times the gross margin for doing the exact same work, but we financed the project, we took the risk, and in the end, if we were successful, it was a much better return for our company and a great win for the client. So I would encourage you as something to consider in your business. Okay. Hack two. Meet your competitors. Um, Sometimes I say this, and some companies already do it. Um, some people look at me odd and go, why, you know, why would we do that, Scott? We're competitors. We're fighting against each other in the marketplace. But we were, uh, in the early days of Advocate, we were kind of the young you know, David. And uh, so we wanted to go and meet 
other entrepreneurs. We wanted to meet other people in our industry if they would meet with us and just talk about our business, talk about our market, uh, perhaps find ways to be a partner. So I would encourage you to do that. Identify companies you admire, call or write the CEO, uh, be courageous, um, you be open, be vulnerable in some ways, and you know, listen and ask questions. You can learn a lot. And as I, I mentioned earlier, when we were the David to the Goliath in the Atlanta market, we met them. Uh, Ten years later, we kind of blew past them in growth. Unfortunately, they had some misfortune. You know, didn't wish that on them by any means, but then we were able to acquire that business. And it was because we had this 10-year relationship. They saw us as David. Yeah, they saw the progress that we made, and you know, they, in the end, had a lot of respect for our business and were you know, delighted to be a part of the, the company. So growth hack number two. Thank you, Sebastian. Form a client advisory board. You might ask, what is this, Scott, what in the world, what does this have to do with revenue or growth? Um, for Advocate, we decided, uh, because our market was so competitive and it was moving so quickly, I mean, we had to reinvent ourselves five times over 20 years. Keep in mind, when we started the company in 2001, the iPhone was still six years away. <laughs> for those of you that you know, don't remember that time. Um, <laughs> and so what Tim and I decided was, wouldn't it be great to get our best buyers in a room, have a trusting relationship, be transparent, be safe for them to give us constructive feedback, even maybe tell us that we're doing something dumb. And so we had developed some relationships with some of our best buyers. We decided to form a client advisory board. We told them we would pay them. They had to all go get it approved by their, they were all public companies, so they had to get it approved by corporate governance. We gave them stock options, and they were a great sounding board for us because they were our buyers. They were buying from us and our competitors. Um, and it, it really was, it was fantastic. And then you know, as part of this, as we matured, we didn't do this the first day, but you know, we held this group together all the way through the Spire transaction and through the Accenture transaction, then we disbanded it. Um, but it, uh, this group uh, developed a lot of trust and confidence in us, and then they would turn around and be, you know, they would open their network to us. So in, in our world, CIOs, CEOs, CFOs, who do they most often go to when they have a problem? One of their fellow CIOs, CFOs, CEOs. That's you know, someone else in their position is who they trust the most. And so this was extremely helpful for us in a very competitive market to differentiate ourselves, open doors, and create relationships. Not only was it a great sounding board for the business, but it was an avenue and a growth hack that, that we employed. Okay, one more time. Thank you, Sebastian. We don't have too much further to go. The fourth growth hack uh, is consider holding an annual client summit. The format that we did it um, was a little different. I think it's being replicated now, and it's, it's probably done in other areas. I'm not saying it was unique by any means. But we really wanted a, uh, a way to get to the decision maker. In our market, selling to CIOs, CEOs, CFOs, those people have dozens of layers of defenses. They're really hard to get to. But if you can get them uh, in a one-on-one -on -one or a small group environment in person, uh, and you can get them where they feel safe and vulnerable, where you're not overtly selling to them, perhaps maybe where they can bring their spouse, where they're going to have some fun at a fun place, at a nice location, and where you're paying for it. When you can get those people in that environment for 36 to 48 hours, you can rapidly deepen relationships. You can talk about problems they're trying to solve they will talk about problems they're trying to solve with their peers in the marketplace and get ideas. Your customers that are there, along with your prospects, will tell the prospects what a great job Advocate did for you in this area. It is a, it's a wonderful symbiotic relationship and something that we ended up, as we were a small company, didn't have a big marketing budget, but we got sponsors. So we had sponsors pay for it. The sponsors could be there, but the sponsors were told no selling. You can spend time and develop relationships. But we ended up doing this 10 years in a row. Accenture loves it. We did it last year with Accenture. We want to continue to do it. It's something different for the business. They've not experienced this. The executives that were there last year said, wow, this is, this is awesome. Um, so I would highly encourage you, if, if this is a technique for you in communicating with customers, it allowed us 
to deepen relationships, to identify opportunities, um, to really create something that we had 50 percent of the audience wanted to come back every year. And part of it was because the spouse would say, that trip to, you know, I don't get to go on many trips with you, but that trip to Charleston, we really had, that was a fun cruise. We had a couple of fun dinners. I really enjoyed being out. You better get being reinvited to that. <laughs> it's funny. I had that conversation a lot with some of the, you know, the spouses. Um, and I've got a lot of slides here. We'll just kind of click through them because it was just, I was really trying to show you this was some content that we used around, like one of the things we used is the Jokari window. Yeah, I don't know if you've seen this before, but it's the, the known and unknown, the, uh, but it was a, a, a kind of a brain teaser icebreaker that we'd use with the audience. It was, it was really powerful. And then, if you'll just kind of click through it, we, we had great topics. They weren't always topics that had to do with things that advocates sold, but they were topics that the audience was really interested in. And when 50 CIOs and CISOs or CFOs got together, these were the things they wanted to talk about a couple of years ago. And they wanted to share information. And it was a safe environment. We weren't recording it, so they didn't have to worry about what they said would appear up on a, you know, Instagram or a YouTube or something like that. They could be you know, comfortable that they were going to be able to share information with peers that were solving and dealing with similar problems. And we had a lot of great people there over the years, a lot of great friendships. If you can, we can just click through these, really, because there's, you know, some people you may recognize, certainly companies. That was a partner of ours at Aptio. Uh, great companies here in Atlanta and around the country. Um, but these were the, the panel discussions. Because basically what we did is we had two days of panel discussions all driven by the clients. There was no advocate selling. And so they were speaking with each other. And some of these sessions could have gone on for hours, but we had to limit them to an hour each because there was just a great network formed. And when people would be here and then they'd leave, they'd take a right, you know, just a phenomenal addition to your network. You'd have meetings here that it would take you five to six years to schedule and have independently. There's no way you could do it. The density of people and the availability of the conversations you could have. So that's okay, last, last page. So those are my four growth hacks. Performance fees, yeah. meet your competitors, um, yeah. client advisory board, and yeah, maybe an annual client summit, something to that effect. I'm hoping that some of you are gonna write that down and take some action. Um, and then ultimately for me, you know, what's, what's after you know, the exit, you know, you know, what I may plan after Accenture is, it's really my family. You know, that's what I, you know, I want to spend more time with. I'm delighted that I've got an 18-month-old grandson, Harrison, who lives here in Atlanta. All my children live here in Atlanta. They're all married. They own houses. They've got jobs. They're healthy. I'm, I'm so blessed. I've got twins coming in September. And so for me, that's, that's the center of my world right now. I'm going to continue to fulfill my obligations to Accenture, and I'm you know, delighted with what I'm doing, and I'm, I'm happy to be here to talk to all of you tonight. So thank you. We're going to do a quick Q&A. Yeah, no problem. Awesome. Does anyone want to t do any questions any on this side? So, by the way, thank you. That was great. Thank you. Um, I want to ask about performance fees. Yeah. When you guys got started, actually, this is a true prong question. When you guys got started, what, were, what kind of led you towards saying, okay, we will take the risk at potentially no cost, but yeah, we will take the reward as well? Yeah. So that's number one. Okay. So, let me give you an, an example project. Uh, you know, a client would engage us to go and look at you know, hundred million dollars within their technology budget and challenge us to go find ways to optimize, to source, to consolidate, to do whatever we could to reduce cost. And so we had a methodology to go do that. We tell the client, okay, it's a hundred million dollars worth of spend. We're gonna take 25% of the first year savings. The client would go, ooh, okay, that's interesting. And we would tell them, but to do that, we're going to need a $250,000 non-refundable retainer. And we're going to you know, have a performance fee. And on its surface, you know, probably that might be hard to swallow. But it was a, real, it was a great story that, uh, if I can I have a minute to tell a story. Uh, and I'm sure Bill Van Curen, if he were here, he wouldn't mind. Bill Van Curen was a, 
uh, the CIO at NCR. And we had this exact conversation here in Atlanta. And uh, I went to, to meet Bill, and he said, Scott, you know, great to meet you. I've you know, heard a lot about your company, um, but this is going to be a bad meeting. Uh, like, nobody's ever said that to me before. I mean, what do you mean? You just met me 30 seconds ago, and it's already going to be a bad meeting. He said, well, I, I've got a $400 million budget. I've got 1,600 employees here. I've got 2,000 low-cost resources in India. What in the world can your little company do for us? And I said, that's a great question, Bill. I've got data. Your procurement team gave me all of your spend data. And a sample of contracts from your top 10 vendors. And I went and did a bunch of analysis. And let me tell you how I think I can save you $25 million. And he said, really? Let's sit down. So that bad meeting turned into an hour and a half meeting. And at the end, Bill said, get, get a proposal from these guys. We're going to go do this work. So the key for us was we had, we had credibility in who we were as a company and our credentials and you know, case studies and successes we could share. But when you have the client's data and you can interpret it for them in a way that they can't and you can bring value, then it created credibility and builds a lifelong customer. Awesome. Second follow-up question. I come from the PwC world. Okay. So how did Accenture take it to say, wait, we will buy you out, but did they continue that model? They are, um, especially in this economy um, for Accenture. Yeah, we are practicing a variety of fee structure options. We're ultimately trying to figure out what, you know, what's most valuable for the client, what way does the client want to buy, what ba way does the client want to pay, and uh, performance fees are a part of the, the portfolio that we have today. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Scott. Any questions on this side? Mm -mm. I know I saw one more. Pretty, do you still have your question? And then. So I have a follow-up question on the same one which you mentioned that when you can revert the client with the informative data, but the point is you generally don't get the client's data to give them information about it. Right. Even how did you get to that point that you're having access to their purchasing information, procurement information that's yeah. confidential. So even to get to that point, yeah. having that meeting, because I think we're all struggling that aspect of it. Yeah. Competency is yeah. not an issue. It's more about... How did you get to that meeting yeah. with, that allowed you? And that is the first step in qualification of an opportunity. For us, it was if I can get the data, then I can make a proposal and I'll win 50% of the time. But if I couldn't get the data, so you know, your question is how do you get it? Yeah. You have to be credible, you have to be authentic, you have to ask for it, you have to show the client you know, easy ways for them to gather the data, you have to show them examples. We were asking for AP summary reports, we were asking for invoices, we were asking for contracts. Um, See, so over time you, you learn, but we got really good at our, we call it a give to get. You give us some information and we're gonna give you back a customized run reduction review study. It doesn't cost you anything but you're gonna be able to tap our benchmark database. We're gonna be able to give you intel. And if we could show clients example and tell that credibly, then yeah, they would have trust in us. We'd sign an NDA and we'd get that data and go do the work. No, that first run reduction review, that was, a, a, that was no charge. That was, we would spend maybe two or three weeks. It wasn't a huge cost for advocate, but it was one in which we were doing work for them to earn you know, their trust and confidence. Okay. Yeah. Scott, thanks for spending your time, or more importantly, your insights with us. Uh, you snuck in over there that Accenture has a very deep checkbook for acquiring <laughs> companies. Now that That's you've right. been on both sides, on That's the right. outside of Accenture and inside, what are the one or two things you tell people here to think about sure. in terms of a partnership or even an acquisition target sure. for Accenture? Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Paul. Appreciate that. Um, couple things. One is, you know, I didn't know it uh, before we started the Accenture discussions and conversations, but Accenture is, I, I think I can back this up with public data, is you know, the most acquisitive company in the world. You know, is, you know, in the last several fiscal years have you know, acquired dozens of companies globally, big and small. 
uh, and has been recognized for the use of its capital and an acquisition strategy to add capabilities that have been accretive to the business. And, and that continues to be the case. There's you know, significant, uh, if you read our earnings announcement or you'd read anything about the company, you'd see that there significant dollars are allocated towards the acquisition strategy. And I would tell, tell any of you entrepreneurs that you know, the whole world of, you know, for Accenture, what we're focused on is total enterprise reinvention. That means you know, with you know, conversations with the board and the CEO, help them figure out how to reinvent their company. Yeah, so they can survive multiple generations, grow and prosper, and you know, do all the good things you need to for shareholders, employees, and clients. But there are ac acquisition opportunities for some of you that I would encourage you to, as you, you build your business, and if I can help you with that, you know, don't hesitate to let me know. But Accenture is definitely looking for capabilities across the world of kind of technology and operations, and many of you may have great ideas. You may have companies that are growing that direction. Uh, don't forget about Accenture. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a nice evening. Thank you, Thank you. Awesome.